27, drop down a little bit. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so God puts Adam and Eve there in the garden of Eden. And the world is their playground. They have everything at their disposal. And God says, I want you to take care of it. I want you to watch over it. You're responsible for it. Not only that, I'm leaving you with the responsibility of populating the entire world. And so it's up to you, Adam and Eve, to populate the entire world. In Genesis 2, turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. God says, look, everything is at your disposal. You can do anything you want. Enjoy the whole planet I created just for you guys. But there's one thing I don't want you to do, and that is touch this tree right in the middle of the garden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then Satan comes along. I want you to notice this in Genesis 3, verse 4 and 5. Notice what Satan comes along and says. He says, you will not surely die. God himself just said, hey, Adam and Eve, you can do anything you want. Just don't touch this tree. And then a couple a chapter later, Satan comes along and says, look, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat, eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And there was this constant pull from the very beginning to be like God. Now, I know that none of you have ever struggled with that, right? To be God in your own life, to call the shots, to make the decisions all by yourself without even consulting the Creator. That was something that was at the very beginning. Look, if you just do what I tell you, the devil says, then you're going to be like God. And that was huge in their eyes. They wanted that. You know, it's even true today. There's a lot of cults today that are built around this concept of you will be God. You're your own God. And so this is nothing new, but here in the beginning, that's the first trick that, the, that mankind fell for. In Genesis 3, 6 through 7, notice what it says in Genesis 3, 6 through 7. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She took it and she ate it. Notice this. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And what was the result? The end result was sin entered into the world, right? Disobedience from God. The world became corrupted. Brokenness came upon our perfect world. Men had to now, instead of being provided for by God, men had to go out and toil and work in the land to provide for themselves. And an interesting thing, that childbirth... Through childbirth, there became this thing called pain. And so women started experiencing pain uh, from, as a result of not obeying God. Notice Genesis 3.23. Notice what else the result in. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground which he had been, been taken. Now notice this. In Genesis chapter 4, we come to the story of Cain and Abel. We see his parents. We see them created from the dust of the earth. They were perfect in everything. God gave them the entire world. And they chose one thing. To go and just be disobedient to God. Instead of following him. Now I want you to notice the effect of sin upon that family. In Genesis 4, 1-2. through The Bible says that Adam lay with his wife Eve. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Now notice this, because it's real subtle. Notice how she says this. I have brought forth a man. Now I notice she says that with the help of the Lord, but there's a lot of pride and arrogance in that one statement. And if we, if we kind of go over it too quickly, we'll totally miss it. She says, look, I have brought forth a man. Uh, similar to how God created Look at what I have done. And so we see this tendency to continue to stay uh, prideful in, even in the midst of their sin. Now, I want you to notice this because this is another subtle thing and I just want to point out to you. 
It says later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, notice this passage. Just take a look at it and just follow along with me just for a second. It says that she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And later she gave birth to his brother. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but one of my professors in seminary proposed this idea of the possibility that they were twin brothers. I, I don't know if that's true, but the kind of the wording kind of might lead to something like that. She became pregnant, she gave birth to Cain, and later she gave birth to this boy named Abel. Now, notice this. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. So on your outline, I wrote this down. Cain equals this, farmer. Write that down. He was a farmer. And Abel equals this, a shepherd. Cain was a farmer who worked the ground, and Abel was a shepherd who worked with his flocks. Now, I want us to notice three things about this story as we go through the rest of it. Three things that you and I can learn about worship from these two young men. Now, notice this. Number one is this. What I bring to God matters. The first thing that you and I can learn from the story of Cain and Abel is what I bring to God matters. Now, notice the story in Genesis 4, 3 through 5 on our outline. It says, when it was time for the harvest, right? It was time for the harvest. Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best of the firstborn lambs from his flock. Now notice what happens. They both bring a gift to the Lord, but notice what it says. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. And this made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. He was not only ticked off, you could tell he was bothered by the fact that his gift, his gift was not accepted by God. Now, a lot of people have tried to speculate over the years, why was Cain's gift not accepted and Abel's was? Well, uh, one, of the, one thing that I want to just rule out, it, it wasn't because one was an animal sacrifice and the other wasn't, right? A lot of people try to look back to the Levitical law and say it was because Abel offered this animal sacrifice and Cain did it. And in all reality, the Levitical law wasn't even in existence at this time. It wasn't until thousands of years later that that happened. So that wasn't the reason why Cain, uh, Cain's offering wasn't accepted. One reason could be, well, could be uh, the reason that it wasn't accepted is because it wasn't offered out of a pure heart. Okay? When, when Cain came, he, he didn't offer it out of a pure heart. When Abel did offer it, his offering out of a pure heart. Well, how do we know that? Well, as we go through the story, you're going to see how his anger was something he continued to hold on to. And maybe that was something that he struggled with, even when he was, was uh, wanting to give a gift. Now, Hebrews 11 kind of sheds a little bit more light on it. I wrote this passage on your outline. Hebrews 11.4 tells us this. It was by faith that, that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. You might want to circle the words by faith. It could be that Abel offered his sacrifice not only as a pure sacrifice, but it was one done by faith in the God that he served. And notice this. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. And God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example, by faith of faith. Now, I love that because the Bible says that even though he's been dead all these years, we can learn from Abel that he gave his offering by faith. And why is that important? Because what you and I bring to God each and every day of the week, it matters. Now, as I was thinking about this message, and I've been thinking about it over the last uh, several weeks, is worship is not something you just do on Sunday, right? You guys got that. I've been saying it all this time. It's not about just showing up on Sunday. It's not about singing this song, I exalt thee. It's about a, a relationship with God, and it's a daily thing where we lift Him up in our life. Um, what we bring to God matters. You know, when we come together as a church, when we come together as a corporate body and we worship together, that's a great thing. But I would just ask you a question. What do you bring to God when you come to church, even? You know, um, sometimes we bring Him our pain. Sometimes we bring Him a negative attitude. 
Sometimes we bring an unwillingness to change. Sometimes we, we, we bring uh, a pure heart uh, like Abel did. You know, uh, the Bible tells us that from these two men, uh, what you and I bring to God is huge. It really matters in our life. I want you to notice this. The kind of sacrifice that God really wants from us. Uh, in Romans 12, 1, the Bible tells us this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. And let's read this underlined part out loud together. You guys ready to do that? Mm -hmm. okay, let's read it out loud. To offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Let's read the rest of it. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now think about this. God doesn't want us to bring animals and sacrifices.